<clears throat> Dave Richards is graciously preaching the sermon today. So for his birthday, and we're, we're letting him preach and giving me the day off this, this week as I was coming back from out of town, spent some time out of town with some family. I just needed time away. But I do want to read to you this morning God's Word where we'll be uh, preaching from this morning. So if you've got your Bibles, I know it'll be on the screen. You can go ahead and turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Um, as you're turning there, I just want to remind you we spent the last four weeks in John chapter 6. Kind of wrapping up a, uh, a, short part, a short part in John, starting with the feeding of the 5,000, uh, going through where Jesus walks on water, to the part now where the last two weeks he's been arguing with his disciples, then arguing with the Pharisees he came across. And here's been the gist of the argument, which Dave is concluding with th today in a, in a different way, is that uh, people are having a hard time believing in who Jesus is because they don't want to. Um, they still want to be responsible for their salvation and how they can work and get to God. And as John is always telling us, mm -hmm. it's not about you doing by your works, it's by your belief, right, by faith. And that's the only way to come to the Father, and Jesus has been telling him, through him, who is the bread of life that it's been supplied for us by the Father. So today I'm going to start reading, just to kind of jump back a little bit, in verse 58, and I'm going to read through verse 65. And it says this, This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in a synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. Verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the only Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. This is God's word. May we pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Just the ability and freedom in our land to come and hear your word preached. Thank you for this, Lord. Father, right now as we come, we know that faith is a gift from you. That unless you open our eyes and open our ears to hear, Father, we cannot believe in you. Such a precious thing, this grace that we have. So, Father, we ask the name of your Son that you would help us to see Jesus today. As he confronts his 12 with the stark truth of, why did you not leave me? Because they had finally believed that he held the words of eternal life. So, Father, may you grant your people in this room today and those who would hear this word eternal life through the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us to believe in you, in you whom we have not seen. But as the scripture has told us, we are blessed because of that, God, because of eternal life that's been given to us. So right now, Father, put away those things, dear Lord, that would hinder us from hearing your word today, the things that we would worry about, God, because nothing is as important as you, God. So help us right now, dear Lord, to put our focus upon you, and Holy Spirit, be with us now and glorify the Son so we may have life and have it abundantly. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so it's been a, a little while, a little over a year since I've preached here. Um, and so my name is Dave, if you don't know who I am. <laughs> but uh, thanks. Thanks. Good. 
but the last couple of times I preached last year, um, we were in Hebrews and then in Titus, and uh, I think there were like three sermons that were all about circumcision, and so I'm happy to report that this sermon is not about circumcision for the first time in a while for me, so that's, that's good. Um, Yesterday, uh, my family and I were down in Auburn, Alabama. We went to a football game as a, as a family, and so we were, I was kind of playing these memories through, through my head of, you know, this is where Liz and I met. This is where this happened, or, or whatever. And I, I remembered when I was finishing school there, I was about to graduate, and, you know, you have all this stress and stuff, like, oh, well, I've got to start I got to get a job, you know, and got to start making money. And this guy invited me to a special business opportunity. I remember when this happened, right? Maybe you've been invited to one of those. And, um, you know, it was billed as a, if you sign up for this, you will get paid. It was one of those, one of those kind of things. And, and I've always been a skeptic, right, when it comes to things like that. But I decided to, to show up anyway. And so you sit through this presentation, and it goes on for a while, and maybe if you make it all the way through, you get a gift card or, or something like that, right? Um, and, and at the event, there was the guy that was sort of organizing things, right? He was the 22-year-old early success story, right? And then there's the older professional guy with a nice watch to lend him some credibility, you know, that kind of thing. And the presentation starts to wind down, and I'm sort of sitting in, in the back, and I'm looking around at the faces of, of everyone in the room. And, you know, maybe there's like 50 people there or something like that. And people are starting to ask this question in their head. You can see the lights coming on, right? So wait a minute. So the harder I work, the more you get paid, <laughs> right? And so people started to lose interest quickly. Uh, they started looking for the, for the exits. The people that were there, including myself, they, they realized that, hey, um, I'm not really going to get paid, <laughs> am I? Or this is harder than it looks, that sort of thing. People started walking away. Interest levels were going way down, and it created this tension in the room. And so the, the passage that we just read, uh, the crowd, the many disciples, leave Jesus. They're, they're not interested anymore. It becomes, you know, there's nothing in it for them, they think, right? And so this isn't a, a perfect analogy or a perfect illustration because Jesus isn't a multi-level marketing guru, just to, just to get that clear. Um, but I think it kind of shows us what's happening with the two groups of disciples, right? Because it, it says in verse 66 there, they turned back and they no longer followed Jesus, so first, we have to get clear the disciples, the idea of disciples. When we hear disciples, we think, oh, well, the 12 disciples. But this passage makes clear that there were, there were many people following Jesus. There were probably hundreds, you know. I mean, 5,000 men showed up just to, to hear him teach, right? And so Jesus wanted to get away from those people at times. There was a large crowd around him in addition to the twelve. And so the other disciples, the many, the crowd, if you will, I think that they probably felt like my friends and I did at this, at this event. They're thinking, this is not really for me. Um, I'm not actually going to get paid. Because they felt like they had better options. They felt like they had better options. And, and the guy organizing it, right, and, and asking people to show up, uh, to, at this special business opportunity and his closest Padawans, <laughs> they maybe felt like a little bit like the 12. And this is what I, I want you to see before we get started, is the 12, they stick by Jesus. They believed, uh, and they think that they've had a good thing going on because there have been crowds following Jesus, right? And people are showing up, and the boss is creating a movement here, right? But now everyone is gone. The crowd leaves, and there's just 12 and Jesus, they would have had a lot of apprehension. They would have had to act in faith to keep following this guy, right? I'll explain this a little bit more when we get to the to end with Peter, but they didn't know how this was going to play out. 
but they abide in Jesus anyway. You see, that the 12, they still really didn't know what was going on, I think, based on the rest of the book of John, because not too much later in, in John 16, we don't have time to unpack it all, but it says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, right? And so they're still confused. And you go through the book of John, and the disciples, specifically Peter, because he's like the, the poster boy of screw up, right? He's, he's, he's the guy that we keep looking at. He still doesn't understand. He still doesn't understand. Um, and that's a theme throughout the whole book is this theme of misunderstanding, right? It's only later under the, the influence of the Holy Spirit that they really understand the significance of Jesus and who he, who he was, who he is, and what he did. So this part of, of John's gospel and the reason why we've, you know, this is three weeks in one chapter, in chapter six, the bread of life and, and all of these things. We could spend six months on this passage, but it's because it's where the action starts to change. Popular opinion is starting to shift. And often when I've heard this, this passage preached, it, it's kind of taught in a way that, well, sometimes it's just not preached at all. It's like, let's do the 5,000 and let's do the good, happy bread of life. Let's skip over the part where everybody leaves Jesus because that's hard and that's kind of depressing. Or, or it's preached in a way that's like, are you in or are you out? And I think that kind of misses what, what, the, what John is trying to communicate here. Because if you place yourself in the story and if you feel the apprehension and the and the fear that those 12 still had in faith, you kind of miss the whole points of the, the first steps of faith, right? Just like the song that we just sang, all the poor and powerless, right? That's us. And that's exactly how the 12 felt. So this can seem like a, a, almost a depressing <laughs> passage of, of, uh, of, of Scripture because everyone leaves. You know, how do you go and preach that? Like, hey, so everybody else left Jesus, so let's hope that we don't lose Jesus. You know, let's, I want to peel back the layers and kind of get you, get you to think about what Peter probably felt like here, about what coming to Jesus in faith really means and what following Jesus is really all about. Because when you, when you look through the gospel specifically, Jesus sees the world and everyone in the scripture relationally. He's not just spouting off facts about, I'm the son of God, or this, or the sky is blue. He's not just giving facts. Those are very true, but he's interested in where you stand with Jesus. He's very interested in knowing you and wanting you, even with your, with your doubts, even with your mixed motives. He cares about you and where you are relationally with him. And if you follow Jesus long enough, or, or, or maybe you've just started following Jesus. Or maybe you're on the fence about the whole Christianity thing in general. If you're a doubter or a skeptic, maybe you're frankly pissed off at the church. I, I don't know. Um, no matter where you are in that spectrum, you will face times in your life where you are apprehensive. Where you are disappointed in others or in the church or anything, really, you will feel like you don't know how it's going to play out. You will feel exactly like the 12 and like Peter felt. And that's 100% exactly how Jesus wants you to come to him. With all your doubt, with all your apprehensiveness and, and all your mixed motives even. So the main idea of, of the, the passage here in, in the sermon is that Following Jesus doesn't require a super Christian faith. You don't have to have it all together, right? You don't have to be awesome and super Christian man. You know what I'm saying? Like the, the whole super Christian idea, maybe you've known some people like that that are super Christian in, but only superficially. That you know behind closed doors, that person doesn't even have a shoulder to cry on and this is all just an act, you know? So before we jump into the passage today, I, I, I do want to pray one more time because I, I need the help because um, 
you know, other guys preach with like iPads and stuff, and I have like pieces of paper with scribbling on them. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's pray again. Um, Father, we love you. We thank you for your word, which exposes us for who we are, but it also tells us who you are and that we need a Savior. So use this text today just to teach us how to start following you or to be better at following you and also to show others how to follow you. We thank you. Amen. Um, okay, so like I said, we've been in John chapter 6 for a while, <laughs> right? So this is the third time, so I, I do want to reach back and, and kind of pull some of the context here. John says that it was a, a hard teaching, right? It says, um, where many, when many disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard teaching. Who can listen to it? No, hard doesn't mean like, I can't understand this. It's calculus. It means harsh, offensive. Like, man, ho- wow, this is harsh. It, it's not that Jesus was being unclear in any way or difficult to understand. These disciples, they've been with him for a couple of years now, at least some of them. They would have conceptually understood what was going on, right? But they are offended. It's a harsh teaching. Reminds me of that Mark Twain quote where he says, um, it's not the parts of the Bible I do understand that offend me. Uh, Excuse me. It's not the parts of the Bible I can't understand that offend me. It's the parts I do understand that offend me because it tells me who I am, that I am a sinner and that I need a savior. It's that sort of thing going on here. So we need to rewind just a little bit for a while. But in verse 59, uh, it says, Jesus said these things in the synagogue in Capernaum. Um, so it's important to, to remember that even though Jesus was a revolutionary type of teacher on the scene, he always did this in public. It's not like he's behind closed doors trying to be subversive or anything. He's in the town where his family lives now. So he's teaching in his own, like where mom is, basically, in Capernaum. That's where his family is. So it's sort of like home. Um, And and later in John, when Jesus is being questioned by the high priest before he's executed, he says, I've always taught in the synagogues and the temples. I've said nothing in secret. So it's important to realize that Jesus has been teaching out in the open for a while. This has been a public teaching. And he's sort of been teaching uh, repeatedly on the, the bread, right? And now eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Ultimately, this is about eternal life. That's what the it is when it says this is a hard teaching. Um, and like I said before, I'm terrible. Um, I'm just going to confess to you guys. I'm really bad at sermon outlines. I've tried, but I'm really bad. And so I just don't do it. Um, you know, like Jody has great notes and stuff. And, and Jose always like does alliteration. Like these are the three P's. So I tried really hard this time to do alliteration. Um, so there's bread, right? We've covered that. So we'll talk about the bread. Then there's blood and there's belief. Bread, blood, and belief. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. See? Good. Good. <laughs> of course, the real, you know, the, the end of the sermon has nothing to do with those three B's. But, um, <laughs> you know, whatever. But, um, so let's, let's look at the bread again, because this is a major teaching, right? It, John 6, we could spend forever there. Jesus says things like, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And things like, whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. So bread is this central, central idea. But why bread? I mean, like, couldn't he have chosen something else like fish <laughs> or something, something else that was nourishing. Why bread? Well, why are the Romans in this area anyway? Like why? Grain. Bread was obviously important to feed the soldiers as the Roman Empire was, was going everywhere. So bread kind of took on this special significance there almost like we would think in terms of like crude oil out of the Middle East. You know, like it was a thing, like they're here for the grain. Um, And Jesus had just fed 
5,000 men with some bread and some fish. Um, and so the people following after Jesus, if you remember in previous weeks, they're, they're looking for more miracles. They're looking for more stuff. Literally, they're looking for more bread. If you remember back in verse 31, the people are saying, well, our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread to eat. Sir, give us this bread always. They, like literally, they thought part of the kingdom that Jesus was talking about was real bread. I know that kind of seems funky to us, but that's really what it was. Because the Old Testament words about manna and bread from heaven and, and Jesus using the bread to feed 5,000 men, and there had been other political rebels showing up in anticipation of Jesus, or before Jesus rather, promising things. Does that sound familiar? Politics, right? So people were looking for stuff. And if you remember this time, like, food was a huge portion of your budget. Like, I've read things between 60 and 80% of your income would have just been for food. So these people in the crowd following Jesus for bread, literally, they thought they were going to get paid. Just like my friends at the special business opportunity right? They thought they were going to get an immediate raise, but once they realized that Jesus wasn't talking about that, he was talking about being spiritually nourished, an eternal, an eternal life, they were uninterested. So that's the bread. Uh, we've covered that in the, in the weeks past. Let's look at the blood, okay? So the followers were offended about the teaching about bread, because they weren't going to get paid. And so if comparing himself, Jesus, to the manna in the wilderness from God wasn't offensive enough, Jesus starts talking about flesh and blood. So let me read from uh, verses 53 and fi through 56. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. So, you know, you can watch shows like Dexter and watch movies with a lot of gore in them, right? And you kind of like cringe. The idea of blood is offensive in and of itself. But the laws of the Old Testament were very, very clear. To eat blood in your meat was extremely offensive because the teaching in, in Scripture in the Old Testament was life is in the blood. So just remember here, Jesus didn't grow up in Rome where they had, you know, sacrifices to other gods and things like that or idols and things. He knew exactly what he was saying. He knew by saying blood that this would offend his Jewish followers. So like if you're sitting down in that context and somebody serves you a piece of meat, and I'm so thankful this, this teaching has changed because, you know, I like my meat on that side of the spectrum. But anyway, it's another topic. If someone served you a piece of meat that had any blood in it whatsoever, or was even like pink, you would have pushed it back from the table and have walked away. So Jesus knew exactly what he was saying here. And if you read on in, in the book of Acts, when the church, the early church, is changing um, the laws, if you, if you will, or they're revising some of the Old Testament laws things, here's where circumcision makes an appearance in the, in the sermon. Sorry. They changed that rule. They said the Gentiles coming into the church, you don't have to be circumcised anymore, thankfully, right? But they didn't change the food law about blood because of the blood of Jesus. So th this is where these people are, are coming from in, in the context is like, blood is that offensive? They changed all the other rules, but not the blood rule, okay? And so reviewing, we, we're, we're walking through this, this book where Jesus has healed people. He's turned water into wine. He's fed 5,000 men. He's walked on water, and then he starts talking about being the bread of life. And he says something like, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. You have no eternal life. Blood has to do with death. If you're following a leader 
and the leader starts talking about his own death, whoa, like, that's, that's weird, you know? And, and the blood, every week when churches gather all around the world, we sing songs about blood now, which is, which is amazing, you know? And just from the teaching of Paul, we could look at a, a bunch of different places in the scripture where it talks about blood, but Paul says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of God's grace. You see, all the while there have been these people following him, and, but the teaching really isn't new. Okay, Jesus has been saying these things over and over again. He told Nicodemus back a few chapters ago, who liked the signs and who liked the benefits of what Jesus was talking about, he told Nicodemus, you need to be changed from the inside out. You need to die to, to whatever you want and to live in me, right? The woman at the well, go and thirst no more. Um, so this teaching is, is not new. Jesus is telling them where eternal life is found, and it's in Jesus. And that leads us to belief, the third B, right? So let me, um, I'm going to read from, from that passage again, verses 61 through 65. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It's talking about Jesus' death. Like, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to go to heaven. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe, and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to, the, to me unless it's granted to him by the Father. So he says something about a uh, belief in there. Specifically, he says, there are some of you who do not believe. And this word belief is all through John's gospel. Like if you just kind of like look through, it's peppered all over the place. But the word translated believe in there, it's almost always followed by the Greek preposition for into. And there's no other parallel in Greek literature at all for this. So John is doing something new with the language here, really. It, this doesn't exist. He's saying, literally, believe into Jesus. Don't just mentally assent to facts like, oh yeah, the civil war happened. It's saying believe into Jesus. Trust him. Invest in that relationship. Take a risk. Believe into Jesus. Jesus. And so this was a huge mind shift for, for the people, right? So it's believing in two. It requires a commitment to let the call of God that initiates that and only comes from God to change the way that we live. You see what the difference is there? And believing into something, the demons believe, Right? That's what the scripture said. Anybody can believe some, some facts, but to believe into, to trust. The other gospels use the word faith. John doesn't use that word. He uses believe here. Believe into Jesus. In John 6, 29, if we're rewinding a little bit, he said, Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe. See, it's not about work and earning God's favor. Your work is believing into and trusting Jesus. So what does bread and, and blood and the eating of flesh, what does that have to do with belief, right? Well, every time you sit down to eat, something has died, right? Either a piece of meat or a plant has, that was once living is now going into you, okay? So quite literally and figuratively, I guess, I'm not an English major, so whatever. But eating and drinking is all about receiving, right? You're taking it into your body, and it becomes part of you. It nourishes you. And so when we come to the scriptures that say, like in verse 30, 63 and 65, it's the spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no use, right? Right? Um, the, and the flesh means just our sin, our intellect, our emotions even, our wills. Or verse 65, no one can come to me unless it's granted to him by the Father. 
Everything about Christianity is about receiving. Yet, why is it so hard? I don't know if you're like me, like I hate getting gifts. I, I have, I, I tend to believe in, in my sinful heart that I can only count on what I earn, right? I have a hard time receiving. Yet this is what offended everyone listening to Jesus. They thought that their right standing with God was something that they could control. Even if they didn't think they were earning God's favor, they still th- said things like, uh, you know, like, They bought into the old lie of self-reliance, going back all the way to Adam and Eve, right? That it's based on something you can do. Even if it's not something tangible, it might be you comparing yourself to others and you saying, oh, I'm not as bad as John, so I must be okay with, with the Lord, right? Or I used to struggle with that sin, but I don't anymore because I got it under control by myself. Or, or things like, you can do this, you know, like out of your own power, you can serve God and go on the mission field and whatever, you're a super Christian, right? That's self-reliance. That's not receiving. Now, our passage is about leaving Jesus, right? And we've probably all known, and maybe we have been that person in the past that have left church or left the faith, left Christianity, um, we've known people like that, right? Um, and we've known people that have maybe left because they've been offended superficially because Christians, including everyone in this room, can be jerks from time to time, right? And people get offended. And maybe that's why you've left the church or maybe you know someone, someone like that that's left the church. But let me give you a better reason to leave Christianity. One day Jesus is going to show you where true bread really is. You may have whatever you're building your life on, whether that be money or your job or relationships or your children or the opinions of others, somehow that thing is going to be taken away from you and you'll be tempted to leave. You'll be tempted to walk because you're thinking, what's in it for me? There's probably better options than this. You see, Jesus didn't come to just give you bread. And there's certainly benefits to following Christianity. He didn't come to give you bread. He came to be the bread. And we receive by submitting to him. So let's, um, let's move on and, and focus on Jesus' question and how Peter responds. After this, many of, disciples, many of his disciples turned back, no longer walked with him. And Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? In other words, maybe. You have the words of eternal life, and we've believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. So the twelve, this is the first time the disciples are referred to as the 12 in John's, in John's gospel. They're sort of assumed in the other synoptics, the other gospels. But these 12 men are chosen as the set-apart handful, okay? And what Jesus is doing, why, why does 12 matter? Um, it's been 800 years since the people of God existed in 12 tribes. So Jesus is sort of reconstituting the people of God under 12 disciples, if you will, and setting off a new course of, of what being God's faithful people is about. And so he asked this question, do you want to go away as well? <laughs> Remember how many people have left. This is a significant number of departures. So hundreds and then 12 are left, right? So it's important to remember when reading the scriptures that Jesus is not stupid, okay? <laughs> Just clear with that. He knows exactly what's going on here. He's not really questioning if they're going to leave because he knows. And in fact, there's something really interesting in the way Jesus even asks the question because the, the words are written there in a way where a rhetorical no answer is, is expected, almost like you would, 
you would say when someone asks you, you know, how, how was your day? And you say, not bad in, in that negative sense. So Jesus is, is expecting them to say no. That, yeah, we're, we're, we're still in this, right? Um, so there is zero anxiety in Jesus' voice in asking this question to his 12. There's even a confidence in the way that he's asking the question, right? And maybe even there's a little bit of relief <laughs> because he was tired. He wanted to get away from the crowds, right? He says, no one can come to me unless it's granted to him by the Father. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. Jesus wants his own people desperately. He's 100% invested in knowing who you are and knowing you relationally. That call goes out to all, but who he calls, stay with him, okay? He's ready at this point in, in the passage to get down to the real business. This happens at Passover one year before he's killed. So you look at, there's 21 chapters in the book of John, and we're only six in. The rest is about the end, okay? So Jesus is saying this and asking this question in a way to comfort the 12, but also in a way to confront them a little bit. Sort of a tough love thing, because look at Peter's response. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall, shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So Peter is basically saying here, <laughs> Lord, the alternatives are not good. We've tried this. We've tried that. We can't think of any better options than you. You are all we have. Now, we don't know exactly what, what Peter is thinking here, right? Can't get in his brain, but... We do know from the rest of the Gospels that Peter is a talk first and understand later kind of guy, right? He's not the most consistent disciple, yet Jesus chose him to lead even. If you remember, just a few chapters later in the Gospel of John, Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, and Peter still doesn't understand. He wants a whole bath. He says, well, if you're washing my feet, like, why not give me a whole bath, right? Remember that? And then after this is when Jesus tells Peter, actually, you're going to betray me three times. And even at the end of John's gospel, when Peter's walking on the beach with Jesus, Jesus has to ask Peter three different times if he loves him. So you see, like, Peter's response here isn't like a puff your chest out, I believe in you, let's go, let's do this. It's probably more of a, I believe. I'm coming to you with, with what I have here. I, I don't have this superhuman faith, <laughs> right? But, but I'm here. I believe in who you are. It's because Peter's a work in progress, just like, just like me and you. Peter's probably thinking, you know, you say really weird stuff, Jesus. Eating your bl blood and stuff, like, that's weird. I, I still don't get this, but we know who you are, and that's enough. So, maybe you've known people that, like, have this faith, right, and the whole super Christian idea. Um, if you ask them how, how things are going, you could, like, hit this person in the face with a baseball bat, and they would still say, well, praise the Lord, you know, like there's this superficial fake faith that exists out there, okay? And, and I've known people like this, and, and I was recently reminded, like, I hate Facebook, by the way, but I'm still on it. But I, I see this, this lady that I knew in the church that, that, I, that I had growing, that I grew up in, almost a, a couple of years ago, her son, who I grew up with, murdered someone. And immediately she's on Facebook still posting like memes of scripture and like, praise the Lord. She wasn't like lamenting. She wasn't saying, oh my Lord, how is, like, what's going to happen to my son? It was this immediate like, praise the Lord. 
And, and look, like, don't get me wrong. Like, the Lord takes us through the rough times of life, but it's the Lord, right? So I, I don't want to discount, like, when someone has a, an illness or sickness or whatever, and you're able to still give thanks and be joyful. What I'm talking about is superficiality there, right? You get the sense that someone like that has never had a shoulder to cry on. She's just white knuckling, pumping herself with her own faith, right? I think it's a danger of some in, in Christianity in the church that you can put so much faith into your own ability to have faith that you lose sight of believing into Jesus and trusting him. When Jesus walked on the water, right, he didn't, it didn't say that, and Jesus took away all their problems immediately. It just said that he was with them and to trust his presence. Because we're not going to be able to escape all the storms of life, right? But bad things still happen. So I think there's a tendency in the church sometimes that we think that following Jesus is never scary or that you have to hype yourself up to be a missionary or, or something like that. You know, like I have friends that are missionaries. They're sinners just like me. They're just stepping out in faith. They're not super Christians. They don't impress me other than their call to faithfulness. You see what I'm saying? Jesus, in extending this call to us, just wants a little bit of faith, like a willingness to participate and follow him, even with our apprehensions, even with our doubts, even with mixed motives. And feeding the 5,000, what happened, if we remember that from a couple of weeks ago? They had all these people and no food. Yet Andrew comes up and says, um, there's a kid over there with, that has a couple of fish. That seems goofy, but it was like, well, what an idiot. There's like 5,000 people out here, more 5,000 men plus everyone else. But maybe that's a picture of faith. He was Peter's brother, by the way. Peter's probably over there embarrassed, like, oh, Andrew, idiot. You know, like, we got 5,000 people. You got a couple fish, man. And you, you might start to think, well, there's 7 billion people on the earth or whatever the number is now. How can we tell them all about Jesus? Start with your neighbor. You got a couple fish. And believing into Jesus. And I think that some of us here today need to hear that this is Okay that you don't have to be a super Christian. Maybe you've been discouraged because you compare yourself to others. Uh, maybe you have doubts that are, that are lingering and you feel like you have to beat those. You don't beat those. Jesus overcomes all. Peter is expressing here in his answer what every other Christian in the history of the world has expressed since. There is no one like you, Lord. I don't have it figured out. I, I, I have no idea what's going on. I still have doubts, but there is no one like you. You can even look at the sequence of the verbs in, in Peter's response. When you believe, then we come to know. Right? Trust in Christ soon becomes assurance in Christ and confidence in Christ and not confidence in in the, th in the things of, of life. So, one more passage to wrap this up. Um, what happens at the end? Right? Peter responds. Look, Jesus didn't give Peter a high five at the end, right? It wasn't like, all right, you're faithful. You're awesome. You're a super Christian now. He kind of confronts him a little bit, doesn't he? Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. <clears throat> so Jesus picks the twelve, and then he also sort of predicts Judas' betrayal here, right? Why is that in there? Um, the crowd leaves, and now Jesus has called someone a devil. Um, first of all, I think it illustrates us, okay? There's the spirit, and there's the flesh, Right? Judas, as we know from later, was kind of in it for money, right? He betrayed Jesus for some silver. But secondly, 
I think Jesus says this to further emphasize God's sovereignty. It's not something that we do to gain eternal life. Even Peter's confession of of faith is something that he received. It's the Spirit who gives life because both Peter and Judas betrayed Jesus. It's the power of God. And this is a, a warning to believers too. So even though like in a way, Jesus is kind of lowering the bar, if you will, about what it means to come to him. He wants you no matter what you've got going on, how messed up you are, how many doubts that you have. The bar is kind of low, but he's also raising the bar here, if you will. We'll use that analogy. Um, Don't presume that you're incapable of losing interest in Jesus one day. If you've built your life on expecting the things of God, if you're looking for your bread elsewhere. You see, like I said before, some of us need encouragement this morning that it's okay not to be a super Christian, right? That belief starts with taking our nervousness and our apprehension, all of that, and like Peter saying, where else would I go? And that's okay. There are others of us in the room who have trouble, maybe like me, receiving from God. We always drift back towards self-reliance. And maybe there's some of us who think that (laughs) that we're the ones who save others, right? Instead of believing into Jesus, we believe in in our works are are those that save others. Wherever you are, Jesus is interested in where you stand with him today. No matter what you've got going on. And here's where you stand with him today. You are far worse off than you ever could imagine in sin. But yet at the same time, Jesus loves you better than you can comprehend. And the way that we respond to that is by believing into Jesus. So just three things to wrap up with the application. Like what does this mean to to us as a body. Number one, come to him with whatever you've got. Most of us know like someone in this room that's dealing with crazy things that are hard. This church has been through hard things, right? We come to Jesus and what we've got. We don't have to clean ourselves up to to talk to God, right? Secondly, as we're starting like discipleship groups and missional communities and things like that, read his word, okay? Jesus said in there, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. You will be tempted along the way to do things in the flesh, right? But read the word. When you gather with others, be encouraged by the word, okay? And then lastly, pray and hope for changed hearts, Jesus and the gospel is all about change. No one ever meets Jesus and leaves unchanged. Okay? I've said that the gospel and what Jesus is saying here, he's interested in relationships, right? And playing off of this idea of change. We're, We're all sinners, but think about the relationships that you have, even in this church with people in the room, or your friends, or, you know, whatever, relationships tend to get toxic when you think the other person will never change. That, oh, well, he did this, and so he is always this person. Thank God that's not the truth. See, when, when we do believe into Jesus, when we realize that it's not about <clears throat> what we do, even if it's comparing ourselves to others or whatever, when we trust that he will change us, the gospel will move forward. One way in which we remember trusting God is when we take communion every week. There's bread and there's juice, right, to signify Jesus' blood. That's meant as a reminder and a proclamation of who God is and what he's done for us in Jesus. So 
in a minute after I, I pray and everyone will come up and we'll sing. And when we take communion, this is a meal that Jesus enacted to remind us of where we are in relationship to him, that we need his everlasting bread and we need his blood to be right with God. And in that, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns, just like Corinthians says. So this is a time when we remember what, what the Lord has done and encourage each other as well, because we need this. This is not just like a, a ritual, right? This is a reminder of who God is and what he has done. So let's, let's pray and, and then uh, you can come forward for communion. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for, for this passage in the book of John and um, what it says about us and who we are in relationship t- to you. Like Peter, we want to say, there's no one like you, Lord. We don't have this all figured out and we're tired of trying. Thank you for, for Jesus who died on a cross while we were still sinners so that we could have life with you. Amen.